Hello, We Thrive Child Care Centers. My name is Andrea Liptak, and I'm a health educator and registered dietitian with Hamilton County Public Health. And I've been helping to implement the We Thrive initiative in child care centers. We Thrive Child Care Centers are committed to making steps toward improving the nutrition and physical activity environment for where children learn and grow through the implementation of policies, enhancing child care menus, and implementing family engagement strategies. Today's learning collaborative topic is one that's frequently a topic of, a topic of concern for many providers and families. Picky eating is a common experience for most children at some stage in their life. This webinar is intended to help review what picky eating is, when it might be more than just picky eating, and discuss strategies for helping children to develop healthy eating behaviors. That includes choosing a wide variety of foods. By the end of this presentation, the goal is that each of you will be able to identify at least one challenge to feeding children, distinguish between picky eaters and problem eaters, understand portion sizes at meals for children, discuss the roles of adults versus children at meals, and then list three strategies for helping children develop healthy eating habits. Okay, so before we start, it's important to identify some barriers to feeding children healthy foods. If you need, go ahead and pause the webinar and take a few minutes to write down some of the challenges you face when feeding children at your home or center. Some of the challenges that have been identified from other providers and families have been time. The parents have limited time to prepare meals, and many parents pre prefer the ease of running through the drive-through rather than meal planning and preparing food at home. Another challenge that's been identified is cost, and many families feel it's too expensive to eat healthy, such as buying fresh fruits and vegetables or whole grain items. Picky eating, so parents don't want to make food just to have it go to waste. A common complaint is that their child will eat only a select number of foods, and as parents, this is frustrating and concerning. Many times, stress around meals causes parents to get to a point where their main concern is just making sure the child is going to eat something, even if it means making multiple meals. Um, and then parents' food preferences. So parents' behaviors around food can largely influence the development of their child's food preferences. I've heard parents say that they won't serve a particular food or vegetable or other item at the meal just because they themselves have never liked it. And if parents are unwilling to try different fruits and vegetables, it's going to be very difficult to get children to jump on board. These are just a few of the challenges that centers face. Um, take some time to think of some others that you might have experienced. So what's normal? There are some behaviors that are common amongst most children as they enter into toddler years. Many children experience unpredictable eating patterns, which can be attributed to a variety of factors. One potential factor is that a child's appetite changes as they grow. Children may choose not to eat foods that are usually preferred and instead eat only a select few foods that they like. This is known as a food jag. With patience and persistence while continuing to offer a variety of foods at meals and snacks, in most cases, children will overcome this food jag within a few weeks to a few months, depending on the child. If the problem continues throughout the year, it may be more than picky eating, and at that point might be recommended a child see a pediatrician for evaluation. Oftentimes, it's merely children exercising their sense of control, however. Also, as many of you probably heard from time to time, it's important to offer foods many, many times. Learning to try and like new foods is a process. So, for example, the first step for a child might be to just have the food set out on the table. The next step after that could be to encourage the child to just put some on his or her plate, and then followed by another meal where maybe they put it to their mouth, try a taste. Eating is a personal experience and should not be accompanied with pressure from others. Later on, we will discuss strategies for dividing responsibilities at mealtimes to help children learn their roles in eating and feeding. As mentioned on the previous slide, appetite changes with fluctuations in growth rate. So the first two years of life, this is a period of rapid growth. And at about age two, this growth significantly slows. And during periods of growth, you may see children who have increased appetite, or maybe those who eat more than usual. And that's common. 
Other times during more stagnant periods where growth and development is slower, children may not be as hungry or hungry at different times of the day. Children may stop eating full meals in favor of smaller portions that are typically offered at snack times. During growth and development, when children are becoming to ex beginning to explore the world around them, there may be less in they may be less interested in sitting down for a meal. Therefore, serving healthy snacks throughout the day is an effective strategy to promote increased intake. During age two to three, what Mary, many parents refer to as the terrible twos, children are beginning to exercise their independence. One way which it's manifested is by battling an adult for control at mealtimes. This is a time where children test boundaries and want to feel a sense of independence. A picky eater is typically someone who, one, is exercising control, or two, someone who has an increased sensitivity to certain flavors and textures. For example, children especially are sensitive to the taste of bitter foods like raw vegetables, dark chocolate, coffee, and tea. Children do, however, prefer sweet foods and simple carbohydrates. It's important to offer a wide variety of foods from a very early age to expose children to the different tastes and textures. And again, especially for picky eaters, it's important to offer new or less preferred foods many times to increase their exposure and likelihood of accepting different foods. There are several differences among picky versus problem eaters. Children who are problem eaters tend to get upset when seeing an unfamiliar food. The stress associated to the presence of the new food alone can cause a child to have a temper tantrum. Problem eaters tend to refuse to eat more than just a few select foods, such as bread, pasta, or hot dogs, and this can be mistaken for a food jag. Food jags, however, will go away with time as long as a variety of food is offered, whereas a child who may be a problem eater can continue to eat only a few select foods for months or even years on end. If forced to try a bite, a problem feeder may choke or gag. This is identified as food neophobia, where a child is afraid of trying new or unfamiliar foods. Today's presentation is focusing, however, on strategies for picky eating. So what do we do? What are some common strategies for preventing or addressing picky eating? One best practice recommendation is to teach children the importance of table manners. Some ideas that have been shared in the past are having a small bowl next to the dinner plate. I like this idea. So instead of having children complaining, saying, ew, this is gross, which we hear a lot, they're encouraged instead to place foods such as bits of vegetables they might not want or maybe breading on fish or meats into a bowl without making any of those comments that really leave parents upset. This helps prevent parents from feeling frustrated after they spent a lot of time and energy making dinner for the family. Another strategy is teaching table, or for teaching table manners is that it's a very important and useful lesson for children. One behavior to teach children is how to spit something into a napkin if he or she doesn't like the food. Other skills you could help children develop at the table is how to pass and share and what kind of comments and conversations are appropriate for the dinner table. And then lastly, when introducing newer unfamiliar foods, one strategy for increasing acceptance is to serve the new food with already accepted familiar foods. For example, if taco night is a favorite meal you know your child loves, this could be a good opportunity to introduce a less familiar food item Maybe smash avocados and diced tomatoes for a simple guacamole dip or in roasted cauliflower. Um, many parents complain that they feel like they've become short order cooks in, a quarter to, in order to accommodate everyone's different food preferences. One best practice recommendation is to make one meal and only one meal. In a blog I follow called Real Mom Nutrition, created by a registered dietitian in Columbus, there are many great resources for, on strategies for picky eaters. One example she gives is, while it's expected that the parent is the one buying and selecting foods that come into the house, a parent may be surprised to see food acceptance increase when asking, when asking the children their opinion on selecting the vegetable for the meal that night, and then offering two or three options for them to choose from. Research shows that the more children are involved in the meal planning and preparation, 
the greater chance a child will be more open to trying and accepting the food. All right, so what not to do. The following items on the slide are that what not to do list when trying to get children to try new foods. Research shows structure is important for children. Structured mealtimes allows children to know when to expect to eat next and create a sense of security. So when children who don't know when or where they're going to get their next meal, they tend to have a greater tendency of being food focused and eating more throughout the day. And these foods are typically high fat, high sugar foods, even when they're not hungry. Also, parents who openly talk about their own food dislikes around the children, especially if it comes to vegetables, can significantly impact a child's willingness to try a new food. Childcare providers and parents are role models in the life of the child. Children are constantly watching and listening to everything that you guys say and do. If a child care teacher refuses to try a vegetable or makes a comment saying maybe, oh, I don't like this vegetable, that's gross, to a certain food, then there's little chance that we're going to get the child to do, be open to accept it as well. It's important to model healthy behaviors and let children decide for themselves if they like the food. While mealtime can be a stressful time for parents with children who are exhibiting picky eating behaviors, it is important to relax, take a deep breath, and try to take the stress out of mealtime. When we talk about family-style dining, we will identify those strategies for taking the stress out of meals for both children and adults. One best practice is to focus on the child care center and home is that food should never be used as bribery or a means of punishment. When an adult says something along the lines of, you can have an adult once you finish all your vegetables, it sends the children a message that vegetables are that less desired food and the dessert is the prize. The goal is to put all foods on the same level, teaching no food is greater than another. It's important to teach on a balanced diet, where there are sometimes foods that we may eat occasionally, maybe once a week or once a month, and then there's other foods that we eat every day. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat dairy, and lean protein would be those foods we'd want to provide at all meals and snacks. Sometimes foods are those we might see at parties, holiday celebrations, or shared at, together as a family, maybe getting ice cream at the end of the week. And there are many way, different ways to do this. I've heard some families who serve an occasional dessert at the mealtime, or even other families who have a candy drawer, and in the candy drawer there's a single serving of sweets each day of the, for each day of the week. But it's actually the child who gets to decide when they want to eat those seven treats. So you may have one child who eats it all at one time and then realizes later on that there's, there's nothing left. So this can teach a child how to eat in moderation. It's, if desserts are withheld as punishment or used for bribery, children may develop an unhealthy relationship and become very focused on sweets and treats. So to avoid this, parents should encourage but not force children to eat what's being served at mealtime. Offering fresh fruits, vegetables, and other healthy foods at all meals and snacks will help promote intake of these foods throughout the day, so there's less pressure placed on mealtime alone, or dinner time alone. This is a good time to pause the webinar and take a moment to think about some of these following questions. Have any of you experienced times where children refuse to eat certain foods that they usually eat? This is referring to when children are having a food jag and are stuck on eating only a couple foods and rejecting most others. What are some strategies you've used to get children out of this stage? Some of the strategies we have discussed on the previous slides can also be useful in helping children overcome food jags such as offering a variety of foods, inviting children to participate in planning and preparation of meals, structured meal times, teaching table manners, and taking pressure out of the meal. If the adult prepares a meal that is well-balanced and nutritious, children will eventually eat when they're hungry. However, if, if they know that dinner is going to, after dinner they'll receive snacks and sweets if they're still hungry, most children will pass on dinner food and hold out for those snacks. If you keep these foods out of the house, however, and make it known that what's served at dinner is going to be the only option, most children will eventually come to the meal prepared to eat. If you're a child care provider, you may be familiar with the appropriate child portions as outlined by the CACFP requirements, detailing how much food should be served per age group. 
For example, for a child aged one to two, an appropriate portion of vegetable is one eighth cup, while children ages three to five is a fourth cup and then goes up to a half cup for ages six to 12. To help teach families child size portions, it's recommended that child care providers use a variety of family engagement strategies. This could look like inviting parents to a family style dining lunch or a potluck, sending home educational resources on the appropriate serving sizes for each age group, and even sharing information on various social media settings, maybe the center Facebook page, Twitter, or even a text or email group. It can be overwhelming for children to see a plate full of food, and that stress may cause them to eat less than they need. Some parents I have met understand this concept and discovered that it ends up being the less food they pack for their child, the more that's typically eaten. One way to serve adequate portions is to teach children how to serve their own plates. This can begin as early as toddler years. Not only does it give children a sense of accomplishment and that independence they're searching for, but it also teaches them portion sizes and how to take appropriate amounts of food. For children not familiar with this concept, the first few attempts at serving themselves may seem awkward, and they will likely need supervision and assistance when they are trying a new food. But as children get the hang of it, they will have a better idea of how much they need to fill up their bellies. Learning Zone Express and other nutrition education websites offer a variety of nutrition education resources where you could purchase handouts and other teaching materials, like the ones you see on the slide, for helping teach parents what a child's plate should look like. While the food featured on this material may not be the best choice options for children, they are foods that children eat regularly. In addition to providing educational materials on portion sizes for children, it's important to offer families education on what a healthy plate should look like, healthy snack options, and feeding strategies. ChooseLightPlate.gov is another great website for learning appropriate portions for children. And it's nice because it goes into specific portions for each age group and activity level. Here's an example of a three-year-old boy who may be active 30 to 60 minutes or more than 60 minutes a day. They should aim for about 1,400 calories a day. Once you click on the link, it would direct you to a sample food plan to show you what 1,400 calories would look like in a day and how you can provide that amount to your child. Another way to help you think about portions is by using the hand method. We do this to measure adult portions as well. For You can see here as an example, the palm of a hand, at least for an adult, that palm of your hand is about the size of a portion of lean meat or protein. One serving of protein is three ounces. And the tip of your thumb is one serving of fat, so such as peanut butter or butter. The same thing applies for children. So here you see an image of a child holding a raspberry just to give you kind of that perspective of how small their hands and tummies really are. We sometimes forget how much smaller children are than adults, and their stomachs are going to have a much harder time trying to eat the same portion sizes of foods that we typically serve. There are similar resources for children in the older ages from 6 to 8, where meal plans are divided by activity level. However, there's no longer a difference between gender. So children at this age can take a more active role in checking off boxes with stickers when they've completed their fruit or vegetable goals for the day. Non-food treats to reward children for reaching their goals may be a helpful strategy to help motivate children, such as letting a child choose the family activity of the week or selecting which park to go and play at. Earlier I mentioned we'd be discussing the roles of children and adults when it comes to feeding and eating. This slide introduces the division of responsibility. Ellen Sater, a dietitian and expert in child feeding, devotes much of her work to researching and educating on this concept. The division of responsibility assumes the basic idea that all children have the natural ability to eat and learn how much food they should consume to meet their daily needs. This is a perfect time for parents to role model healthy eating habits by trying foods together and teaching table manners, as we've talked about before. Okay, so the responsibilities change depending on the age of the child. So for an infant, the parent is responsible only for what the child eats. 
The American Academy of Pediatric recommends breast milk as that gold standard. Breast milk is breast milk is not an option, then iron fortified infant milk may be used as a substitute. As for the infant, their responsibilities during feeding is to decide how much and then basically everything else. It can be a challenge for a child care provider to meet this recommendation if there are set times and place for feeding infants. If possible, encourage staff to learn hunger cues and allow the infants to decide when and how much they want to eat. Once the child starts to eat solid foods, roles begin to shift. When it comes to feeding children, the adult is now responsible for the what, the when, and the where. This touches on the importance of building structure for meals. Having a set time and always having meals at the dinner table when at home, away from distractions such as the television, creates an environment that helps children focus on eating and may improve the acceptance of new foods. At this stage, children are now responsible for whether and how much food they want to put on their plate. Parents may struggle at first letting go of that control, as many have become accustomed to common strategies of getting their children to eat. Using phrases like, just try one more bite, or you won't get dessert unless you finish what's on your plate. These strategies tend to backfire and add stress to both the adult and the child at mealtimes. Children may not be inclined to take the vegetables at first, which is a natural reaction. Most parents are concerned that their child will not end up eating enough food. This leads to parents then crossing over that line of responsibility and then taking on both roles. And this can cast a shadow on mealtimes. Over time, parents who practice the division of responsibility are pleasantly surprised to learn that in time, as their children start to feel like they have some control at meals, they will become more adventurous in eating as the stress of trying new foods goes away. So why do we cross the line? It's easy to understand why most adults may do that. Seeing a child pick at dinner can cause parents anxiety and frustration. Feeding interferes that their child isn't getting enough calories a day to adequately grow and develop. In general, parents want the best for their children, and so mealtime is no different. However, it is important to show parents how the division of responsibility can not only reduce stress at meals for all family members, but also promote children to develop a wide range of food preferences and openness to try new foods. As a child care center, you are in a unique position in that you have the ability to help teach parents how to implement family-style meals, which focuses on the division of responsibility. Meal times at your center or home provide an opportunity to teach children table manners, offer fuel and nutrition to help them learn and play, and help children develop healthy relationships with eating and feeding. In today's fast-paced world, Family-style meals are not as common as they once were. I wonder how many families create a mealtime environment that re resembles the picture in the bottom right of this slide. With more and more single family parent families, mom and dad both working, school meetings and scheduled activities during regular mealtimes, my guess is that many meals involve a quick stop through the drive-thru where children and parents are distracted, rushing from one activity to the next or even nights where meals are served sitting in front of the television. As a child care provider, you can teach parents how to implement family-style meals. You can promote family-style dining in the home by sharing what you do in the center with the families you serve. One way you can do this is obviously sending out educational materials on what family-style dining is and how they can help children develop healthy eating habits. Taking pictures of mealtime and sharing that with parents is another really great way to educate families on family-style dining. The next few slides will focus on how family-style meals can be implemented in your home or center. Unfortunately, the video here won't play on the webinar, but if you copy and paste the URL at the bottom of your web browser, a quick three-minute introductory video on family-style dining will play. I encourage you to take this time and watch before moving on to the next slide. The recommendation from the Child and Adult Care Food Program is to implement family-style dining as opposed to the offer versus serve. In offer versus serve, all food items are placed on the child's plate and served by the adult. 
Children are not given a choice to which foods they want or how much to give. Taking extra steps to implement family-style meals can have great benefit for a child's development. Family-style dining has been recognized for its success in helping introduce new foods to children and provide children choice when it comes to mealtimes. Okay, so what does family style look like? How can it be implemented? There's really no one right way to implement family style dining. In the home, this could be where all the food's set out on a counter for everyone to be able to walk through and put whatever they'd like on their plate. Another strategy could be to place all food in sharing dishes so children to pass around the table with adult supervision and have available during mealtime. This could be especially useful when trying to introduce new foods where exposure may help a child to accept that unfamiliar food. So by being able to see it on the table throughout the meal can help increase that likelihood that at some point they might um, take a bite. If your center or home is part of the Food Assistance Program, CACFP, for families, one concern I often hear is that each child is supposed to have those required portions of each food item to be re reimbursed. The CACFP Implementation Guide explains how family style can meet this requirement as long as there's enough food prepared and available to meet the meal pattern requirements for each child. For instance, serving enough portions into large sharing dishes and then letting children pass around the dish to decide whether or not they want the food on their plate. To ensure correct portions are given to children, you can use you can replace the scoops and utensils with measuring cups and spoons to help make sure children are getting that appropriate portion size. It's important to encourage staff to join in and role model healthy dining practices and eat the same foods together with the children when possible. Facilitating conversation, teaching table manners, and trying new foods together are all important steps in helping children to develop healthy eating behaviors. Implementing family style in the child care center and home can teach children how to identify appropriate portion sizes, coordination and motor skill de development, such as passing and pouring, and how to take turns and share, and as mentioned previously, appropriate table manners. The Ohio Child Care Resource and Referral Agency has a great guide with step-by-step -step recommendations and implementation of family style dining in the child care center. I strong you, strongly encourage you to um, check it out. So, have you started implementing family style in your center or child care home? Have you considered it if you haven't? And if you have started, I encourage you to send me an email, maybe sharing your success story. Sharing and learning from those who've already taken steps and overcome barriers is a great way to assist others who are headed in the same direction. And I'd love to share your success stories on our website at watchusthrive.com or .org, so feel free to contact me. My information will be provided at the end of this webinar. This slide identifies some of the many strategies that can be used for helping children develop healthy mealtime habits. Recommendations include creating a stress-free environment where children are free to make decisions and try new foods at their own level of readiness. Offer new foods with familiar foods so as not to overwhelm a child. And talking openly about food. So for example, Talk about what the food tastes like and maybe related to other foods you know the child prefers. You can talk about colors and what other foods are that same color. The more you talk with children about foods being served, the more comfortable they will feel with the idea of even trying it. Another way to make foods more familiar is by doing classroom and circle time activities that involve exposing children to different fruits and vegetables or unfamiliar foods. Reading books, crafts and art projects, rolling role play, and even field trips to the farmer's market, or maybe inviting a farmer or garden expert to your center can provide additional experiences, helping to reduce that fear when it comes to trying new foods. Research shows the more children are involved in food preparation, the greater likelihood that they'll be willing to try a new food. Teaching children where food comes from by practicing gardening in the center and home, allowing children to participate in selecting healthy snacks, and getting kids in the kitchen are all excellent strategies for growing great tasters. Don't forget, the more exposure, the greater likelihood children will try a new food. 
the fruit and vegetables, you could use fruit and vegetables in place of stamps or paintbrushes for arts and craft activities. You could use dried beans to make instrument shakers. There's really a world of possibilities. So whatever it is, this is the time to let children, and sometimes ourselves, have fun and play with their food. The internet is full of great ideas and resources to help you get started. Another commonly used strategy for encouraging children to try new foods is to make eating fun. Try giving silly names to foods which pull on a child's imagination. One book that addresses this strategy is called I Will, Not Ever, I Will Never Not Ever Eat a Tomato. And in the book, Charlie's younger sister, Lola, declares that she's never going to eat carrots or tomatoes, as well as a laundry list of other vegetables. And in an attempt to encourage Lola to try the new foods, Charlie tells her they're not carrots and tomatoes, that they're actually orange, orange twiglets from Jupiter and mood squirters. And with each new food introduced to Lola, Charlie tries to find a way to make these new foods fun. And in the end, Lola discovers she likes, these, likes trying them all out in the end. Sometimes it's all it takes is a little fun to take away the stress and anxiety of trying new foods. You can also present other healthy food groups in other ways, such as checkered board sandwiches and transitioning to whole grain bread, serving foods in bite size, or serving it on a stick to make it easy grab and go for children. If you're someone who does not consider yourself a creative person, the internet is a great place to go for ideas and making foods festive. Maybe red pepper boats, fruit, cre fruit Christmas trees, clementine pumpkins, and even cutting up fruits and vegetables to let children make shapes and designs. Again, any other ideas you guys have on strategies for getting children to try new foods, maybe through your own personal experience, please feel free to send um, my way, and I'll be happy to share with the greater We Thrive child care community. And here's a quick today review of today's goals. I hope you've taken away some new tips and strategies for helping children to develop healthy mealtime behaviors. If you have any additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact me, my information provided on the slide. Or if you'd like to share any of the feedback, the challenges, the success stories on the sharing slides we discussed today, I would love to get your input and share with the larger community. Here are some links from today's website if you are curious to check out some of the resources we mentioned within the presentation. And last but not least, thank you so much for listening, and stay tuned for additional webinars.